بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله أجمعين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته In all of our previous classes what we've been doing is basically laying the foundation upon which a Muslim's belief rests upon. Such a strong, solid, concise foundation that basically instills yaqeen. It instills conviction in our hearts that, you know what, this religion is definitely, without a shadow, without a shadow of a doubt, it is from Allah, the Lord of the worlds. And so in a sense, what we did is we went on the offensive. And so in the world of doubts and allegations and accusations against Islam, the Muslim, the very first thing he should do is not try to take those accusations and try to confront them, answer them, refute them, and deal with, you know, these opponents directly. But rather, the very first thing that a Muslim should do is sit down and learn the basics of his deen. Learn what Islam teaches us concerning our beliefs. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us concerning himself? What do I have to know about Allah and believe about Allah? What do I have to learn about this deen that Allah has sent? And what do I have to believe about it? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Quran. What is a Muslim's belief? And what will help me to instill certainty and conviction in my heart? Concerning these beliefs, that is basically what we have been doing through, throughout all of the previous classes. Now what we want to do is we want to now address these doubts, these allegations, these attacks, these accusations against Islam. Now we want to go on the defensive. And this is the correct methodology to take. The Muslim should not have a defeatist mentality. He should not always be on the defensive, taking on these accusations and these doubts and confusing his mind with these doubts and just focusing on them without first establishing a foundation for himself, a strong, solid foundation. Once you've done that, once you've established that strong, solid foundation, now you're ready to go out and confront the opponents when they come and they make these allegations and these accusations against Islam. So now what we want to do is we want to take a look at the doubts that come in the minds of some Muslims concerning this deen. Or some of the common allegations that the enemies of Islam throw at us. And we want to deconstruct them. And the way we want to do this is we first want to identify some of the common underlying errors that many of these doubts and these allegations are based upon. Or in other words, we want to identify the errors in many of their arguments. And how these doubts and these allegations are really based on something that is not solid, something that is not concise. What we want to show is how these claims and these allegations against Islam, how basically they don't hold any water. That is what we want to do today. And so when we look at many of the doubts and the allegations against Islam, we find that the line of argument used 
in each, it varies in terms of its strength. And so some of these doubts and some of these allegations can easily be dismissed by even your average Muslim. For example, doubts concerning the existence of Allah, your average Muslim can easily dismiss these doubts. But then there are some other doubts and allegations that require more analysis. Because now the opponents are bringing proof and evidence. So now you need to know how should I deal with these proofs? How should I deal with these supposed evidences? And so the accusations and the doubts and their arguments, they differ. Not all of them are the same. Not all of them are the same. And so the following steps will help us to identify the underlying errors in many of the common doubts and allegations against Islam. And these steps, they are arranged in order, meaning that when you're unable to identify the error in the first step, then you move on to the second step, and then on to the third step, and so on, until you arrive at the final step. And so basically what we want to do is we want to have a map in front of us that when we hear an allegation made against Islam, how do we go about dealing with it? How do we go about dealing with it? These five steps, inshaAllah ta'ala, they will help you to deal with each allegation and each shubha, each doubt concerning the deen of al-Islam. So let's have a look at these steps. And inshallah ta'ala, we're just going to go over these steps today and mention a few examples for each. And then in the coming classes, we'll go more in depth concerning the examples. So some of the common uh, doubts, shubuhat concerning Islam, or concerning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his existence, or uh, for example, concerning the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, concerning the Quran, concerning certain legislations of Islam. You know, why has Islam legislated certain things? And the doubts concerning those legislations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in the coming classes, we'll look at each of those in more detail. But today, we just want to cover these steps and mention a few examples uh, concerning them so the very very first step that you should take when you hear of a doubt or an allegation against Islam is that you verify that this allegation does not go contrary to the reality of what we believe to be true so the very first step, you make sure that the allegation that is being made, it does not go contrary to the reality of what we Muslims believe to be true. And being cautious of the straw man fallacy. Being cautious of the straw man fallacy, which we'll explain later. So many allegations against Islam are actually based on fabrications. They're based on lies that are associated with Islam to the point where people start believing that, you know what, this is what Islam truly represents. And usually those who believe in these allegations are those who don't really have uh, any access to Muslims to ask them. Or, uh, you know, they simply believe in what they're told without asking for proof. And so 
these allegations, what we can say is that in reality, they are not an attack on Islam, but rather they are an attack on what is claimed to represent Islam. And so how should we deal with such allegations? By simply not spending too much time and energy in responding to them. But simply pointing out how these are false allegations and that Islam in no way whatsoever, in no way whatsoever does Islam represent what is being claimed here. And there are many examples of this. There are many examples of this, how certain allegations, certain shubuhat, they are simply uh, claims that are made and that are associated with Islam, that are associated with Islam, but in reality, Islam has nothing to do uh, with these allegations. They are simply false, fabricated allegations that have been made against Islam. <clears throat> And so, simple examples of this, for example, those who claim that Islam is a pagan religion. It is a pagan religion. So Islam is like Hinduism and these other religions where people worship idols. Where do they get that from? They say, we have this Kaaba this structure in Mecca and they see us praying towards it and bowing down to it, making sujood to it. So they say we worship the Kaaba and we worship the black stone, we kiss it. So this is one example. Another example is that Muslims worship the moon god. That Muslims worship the moon god. Because we have a lunar calendar and we look for we look for the moon, the, the new moon at the beginning of each month. Or for example, that Islam is a religion that was only sent for the Arabs. It's a religion that was only sent for the Arabs. And only if you're an Arab or you speak Arabic, only then are you a Muslim. And so these are some examples of uh, allegations that really don't hold any water. So how do we respond to these allegations? By clarifying that none of these allegations are true to begin with. That's all. It's as simple as that. And that they are actually based on twisting facts and are perfect examples of the straw man fallacy. So these are examples, perfect examples of the straw man fallacy. So what is a straw man fallacy? The straw man fallacy is a form of argument based on giving the impression of refuting the opponent's argument while actually refuting an argument that was not presented by the opponent to begin with. So the, the straw man fallacy is a form of argument that our opponents use based on giving the impression of refuting our, our arguments while actually refuting an argument that was not presented by us to begin with. And so the Muslim, he has to pay attention to such fallacies. He has to pay attention to such fallacies and not engage with the opponent by presenting counter arguments and evidences before assessing how true the allegation even is. So before moving any further, verify, check, is this allegation even true? And your average Muslim can easily detect that such allegations are not true to begin with. So this is the first step, verify. 
does this allegation represent what we believe in or not? So you don't even have to go into uh, trying to disprove the allegation. You simply say, all you say is that, for example, Muslims, we don't worship the Kaaba. This allegation is unfounded. It is not true to begin with. But rather we Muslims, we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as for the Kaaba, it is only the direction of prayer that we have. And what proves that we don't actually worship the Kaaba is, for example, these days where there is nobody by the Kaaba, or if there was ever a time when the Kaaba is destroyed, we would still be facing that direction. Even if the Kaaba did not exist as a structure where it is, let's say it was destroyed and it no longer exists there, we Muslims would still face that direction. So the direction, so the Kaaba is only a means of worshiping Allah. It is a direction that Allah has commanded us to pray in. Uh, so this is the first step. This is the first step in dealing with uh, these shubuhat, these doubts and these allegations. Moving on to the second step. Making sure that there is evidence to back the doubt or the allegation and that it's not simply an accusation that is made without supporting evidence. So now we need to look is there evidence for this claim? Is there evidence for this claim? And so all doubts and allegations against Islam or against some of the foundations of Islam come under two kinds. The first is an accusation that is spread around without citing any evidence. And the second is an accusation or an allegation that is supported by some kind of proof. They mention, you know, this is our proof. So how do we deal with the first kind? We ask our opponent, prove the validity of your allegation. You've made a claim. Now prove what you are claiming. So if our opponent cannot bring forth proof, then the allegation that he is making is worthless and thus it falls apart. The reason for this is because if we accept claims that are made without asking for proof and evidence, then the defendant can also, can also make a claim without backing it by any proof. So our opponent makes a claim and he doesn't bring any evidence, then I could also make a claim and not cite any evidence. And in this way, what will happen is that there will be no meaning for proof and evidence. There would remain no meaning, no value for something called proof and evidence. And thus we can never arrive at the truth about anything if we were to you know, continue in this way. So the very, very first thing that we have to do is ask for proof. Don't just take it for granted that, oh, you know, uh, this is what Islam says, and this is what you guys believe in. And now you take it and you start to refute that accusation. And this is the mistake that some Muslims make, is that we rush to counter some of these allegations with our own proofs that will refute the claims being made, but without asking for proof in the first place. And so this is not the right way of approaching some such doubts because the golden rule in any debate is that the onus of proof or the burden of proof lies upon the claimant. 
not upon the defendants. So, you know, they, they make a claim and you rush to refute that claim by bringing your own evidences without even having asked for his evidence. In fact, in our own traditional Islamic scholarship, when talking about debates and debating methods, our scholars, they refer to the claimant not bringing any evidence, our opponent, if he can't back his claim with proof, then they refer to this as ifham. This is an ifham. Ifham basically means a striking blow to the opponent, silencing the opponent. And they say that this is enough to end the debate. So the opponent makes a claim. He doesn't back it with evidence. You ask him, what is your evidence? He can't produce any evidence. The debate is over. The debate is over and you've won the debate. So what are some examples of this step? Uh, there are many examples of this. For example, the claim that Islam is a violent, bloodthirsty religion. And they say this without giving any evidence. Or that Islam oppresses women. Or that Islam encourages slavery. Or that there's no way to prove the validity of our hadith scriptures, hadith texts that are claimed to be 1400 years old. So these are claims that they make and usually they don't, they don't give evidence. They don't give evidence with these claims. So how do we respond to, the, to these allegations and these shubuhat? We don't start by trying to prove these allegations wrong. So pay attention. Don't start by trying to prove that these allegations are wrong with counter arguments or proofs. So for example, we don't start by saying that, you know what? So, so basically our opponent, he says, Islam is a violent, bloodthirsty religion. It can't be the truth. It cannot be the true religion of God. It's a bloodthirsty religion. It's violent and so on and so forth. Maybe he'll say, mention, you know, examples from what we see around us today and base his allegation on that. So now what do you do? It's wrong for you now to say, no, you know what? Islam is a peaceful religion. Islam is a tolerant religion. And this is a common way of responding that many Muslims, they take. But this is wrong. And then you say, here are all the proofs that Islam is tolerant and peaceful and this and that. Instead, what we should do is we should ask the opponent, what is your proof that Islam is a violent, bloodthirsty religion? Ask him, what's your proof? And when we say proof, we don't mean what we see around us today. Because you don't judge something by the actions of the followers, but rather you judge it by what it teaches. So you don't judge Islam based on the actions of Muslims, but rather you judge Islam based on what Islam actually teaches. So ask him for evidence from the teachings of Islam, from the sources of Islam, from the Quran, from the Sunnah. And usually, usually such people, this is how they're silenced. That's it. They can't, they can't cite you any, any proof, any evidence. Now, if somebody does give you evidence, he says, okay, let's look at the Quran, let's look. Then we move on to the next step. But now we're talking about someone who can't cite 
any evidence, any proof for you. So if he can't, then his allegation is worthless and it falls apart. So now we move on to the third step. So now he comes with evidence. So this is now where we move on to the third step. So what is the third step? The third step is verifying the validity of the proof that the allegation is based upon and looking looking at both the proof and the conclusion looking at both the proof and the conclusion that is being made from that proof so if the opponent who makes an allegation against islam comes with proof to back his claim what we have to do is the first thing we have to do is we have to separate the proof from the conclusion as well as looking at how he went about using this proof to arrive at his conclusion then we take a look at the proof to see how valid it is we do this through different ways this is done through different ways the first is by looking at the authenticity of the evidence the second is, was the evidence understood properly? Irrespective of whether it leads to the conclusion or not. Was the evidence understood properly? Third, was it selected properly? Meaning, you're talking about a, a particular issue and you have a wide range of evidences but the opponent, he chooses only one evidence that suits, that suits what he's trying to do. And he ignores all the other evidences on that particular topic. So was it selected properly? And fourthly, is it a valid proof for the one using it? The opponent, does he even consider this to be valid evidence? Or is he just using it to serve his own agenda, to serve his own purpose? And so let's look at each one of these ways. So firstly, we said, how authentic is the evidence? And so many doubts and allegations are based on inauthentic evidences. An example, the claim that our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he wanted to commit suicide by attempting to jump off of one of the mountains. And that this was because the wahi, the revelation had discontinued. And so early on, when the Prophet ﷺ received revelation from Jibreel, he was receiving revelation and then there came a period of time when the wahi is stopped. And this discontinuation is authentic. It is true. It did happen. And then after that long period of time, even though the Prophet ﷺ was saddened, he was, uh, you know, he was in grief. Because the kuffar of Quraysh, they were saying, look at how his Lord has abandoned him. They were making fun of him. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Surah Al-Duha. And in it Allah said, your Lord has not abandoned you. But this story of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa attempting to commit suicide, although it is mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari, yes, it is mentioned there, but it is not authentic. Now you may be wondering in astonishment, how can you say that something mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari is not authentic? So how do we respond to this? Let's say our opponent, he cites this example knowing 
the status of Sahih al-Bukhari, uh, according to us, that it is the most authentic source for us Muslims after the Qur'an. So he says, look, it's in Sahih al-Bukhari. So how do you respond? We respond by saying, yes, it is mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari, but Imam al-Bukhari only mentioned it to show how weak it is. And so when we go to the explanation, the commentary of the scholars, we go, for example, to Fath al-Bari by Ibn Hajar, rahimahullah. He mentions that Imam al-Bukhari, first what he did is he mentioned this hadith. He mentioned this hadith according to the authentic narration. And in the authentic narration of this hadith, there is no mention of this story of the Prophet ﷺ wanting to commit suicide. After that, Imam al-Bukhari mentioned this, ver this second version of the hadith where it mentions the story to show that this second version is not authentic. And that the first version that did not mention the story, that was authentic. And this is the way of Al-Bukhari. For the one who knows the science of hadith and has studied hadith methodology and the sciences of hadith and knows how Imam Al-Bukhari authored his and compiled his book, he would know that this is a methodology of Imam Al-Bukhari. So the point was that this story is not authentic. So the first thing we do is we look at the authenticity. Um... There are other examples as well. For example, uh, those hadith that appear to contradict modern science. Uh, and, you know, uh, they say, look at what your Prophet wasallam says. And this contradicts modern science. For example, there's a hadith that, uh, the, the, that we should not eat cow meat because uh, it contains disease. And modern science today proves that there's no disease in cows and we can eat it there's no problem so when we go back to that hadith we find that it is an inauthentic weak hadith and so on and so forth so the very first thing we do is we ask about the authenticity of the proof the second thing what did we say we look at was the proof understood correctly or not even if an allegation is based on a proof that is authentic, it could be that the opponent did not understand the proof correctly, either based on the language. So he didn't understand the language. Maybe the translation into English was off or he went to the Arabic and he understood it incorrectly or it was not based on the correct context. It was taken out of context or other things that give the wrong understanding. And so for this, we have examples. For example, those who take the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ In Surah Al-Kafirun, Allah says at the very end, for you is your religion, and for me is mine. Those who use this to try to prove that, those who follow other religions, and these are the modernist Muslims today. The modernist Muslims today. The progressives. They say, we should not call these people kuffar. We should not call them disbelievers, because Allah says here, Commanding his Prophet or the Prophet is saying, Lakum dinukum wal yadin. You have your religion, I have mine, we can peacefully coexist. Or, uh, you know, uh, we don't have to give da'wah to Islam. We shouldn't say you have to enter Islam, otherwise you're going to be doomed, and so on and so forth. Using as evidence this ayah. So how do we respond? We respond by saying that you have understood this evidence incorrectly. You took it out of context. And so if you go to the beginning of the surah, you find 
the very first thing, what does Allah say? قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ Oh, you who disbelieve, oh, kuffar, oh, kafirun. Right from the get-go, Allah calls them kuffar, calls them disbelievers. So it was taken out of context. Another example, and this is a common example, uh, those ayat in the Quran where Allah says, وَقْتُلُوهُمْ حَيْثُ وَجَدْتُمُوهُمْ وَقْتُلُوهُمْ حَيْثُ ثَقِفْتُمُوهُمْ Kill them wherever you find them. Kill them wherever you find them. And so the enemies of Islam, they often uh, use this ayah in the Quran to show how Islam is violent and bloodthirsty. So how do you respond to this? You say that the verse is, is not understood properly by you. And you've taken it out of context. So let's take an example. In Surah At-Tawbah, in the fifth verse, Allah says this. Kill them wherever you find them. Now, what we need to do is we need to now go to Surah At-Tawbah and read it from the beginning. And so when you read it from the beginning, it says basically that there was a peace treaty between the Muslims and the Mushrikun of Mecca. And this treaty, it was violated by them. And a period of four months was given for them to make amends. Otherwise, war would be declared against them. And then this verse comes, the fifth verse, where Allah says, kill them wherever you find them. So now we understand that this verse is quoted in, in the context of battle. It's quoted in the context of a battle. You're in the middle of a battle with these people. You're in the middle of a war. The language is stern. Yes, the language is very, very, very heavy, very fierce. But why? Because of the context. In a state of war, you use such words to boost the morale of the fighters. And so if today, you know, let's say the army general of uh, uh, a certain country, he says to his soldiers, while they're in a, in a state of battle, they're about to go and fight against the enemy. He says, wherever you find them, kill them. Now, if you take that out of context, you don't mention that, you know, this was mentioned in a state of battle, then you'll make him sound like a savage, which is exactly what the enemies of Islam try to do with the Quran. The third, the third point, what did we say? Was this evidence selected properly from among all of the proofs on that given subject? And so sometimes the proof can be authentic. It could even be understood correctly. But the one who is using it is being selective. Ignoring the many, many other proofs under that same topic. Giving, giving this unbalanced picture. So when you gather all of the evidences on a, a particular given topic, if you gather all the evidences, then you'll be able to come with a balanced conclusion. But when you are selective and you take only those evidences that suit your agenda, then obviously, obviously, you're going to, you know, give this unbalanced picture of Islam. And there are many examples of this. One example is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, La ikraha fi deen. There is no compulsion in religion. There is no compulsion in religion. They use this. Again, the modernist Muslims, 
so-called progressive Muslims today, they use this to prove freedom of religion. And like we said concerning the other ayah, لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَالْيَدِينَ To say that we shouldn't tell people that they're doomed if they don't accept Islam. Because Allah says here, لَا إِكْرَاهَ فِي الدين. There is no compulsion in religion, meaning you don't have to accept Islam. It's okay, you can remain a kafir. And so they use this to cite, or they use this uh, as, as evidence to say that Islam promotes freedom of religion. Freedom of religion. So how do we respond to this uh, shubha, to this doubt? We respond by bringing all of those other proofs that show the obligation of accepting Islam. So what we tell this person is, you are being selective. You are choosing only those evidences that suit your perspective on this issue. Let's bring all of the evidences. So when we bring all of the evidences that talk about accepting Islam, and entering into the deen of Islam, and the punishment for those who don't enter, enter into Islam in the Akhirah, what do we find by gathering all the evidences? We find that there's, you know, without a shadow of doubt, that Islam is obligatory upon each and every single human being to accept. There's no doubt about it. And that those who do not accept Islam and they die in a state of kufr and they die as kuffar or as mushrikun, then they are destined for the hellfire. A Muslim has to believe in this because of you know, the many, many, many evidences in the Quran and Sunnah that prove that. And then if you want, you can explain what this ayah actually refers to. Again, it's taken out of context. And they're being selected. So this ayah, لا إكراه في الدين, there is no compulsion in religion. What it refers to is uh, in the Islamic state, in a Muslim country, the disbeliever, he can remain upon his religion. He can remain on his, on his religion uh, without accepting Islam in exchange for jizya in exchange for jizya, which is the tax that he has to pay in order for him to freely practice his deen. Another example of being selective is those who claim that we have no free will uh, by citing all of those evidences from the Quran and Sunnah that show that Allah has decreed everything and Nothing is outside of the Qadr and the Mashi'ah, the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how do we respond to that? To, to say that, no, we human beings also have free will. We say you are being selective. You are only choosing those evidences that suit your perspective. If we were to gather all of the Nusus, all of the texts of the Quran and Sunnah on the topic of the Qadr of Allah and His Mashi'ah, His will, what do we find? We find that we can take a balanced approach. And that is to say, yes, Allah has decreed everything and everything is by the will of Allah. But on the other hand, Allah has also given human beings free will. Uh, the fourth, the fourth point is to ask, is this a valid proof for the one who is using it? So there are those who will make allegations against Islam by citing proofs that may be authentic and understood correctly, fine. But these people, they don't even believe in the validity of this proof to begin with. And so this shows their inconsistency. How can you use this as evidence against us 
when you don't even believe in the validity of this evidence to begin with. And so, an example of this, it doesn't only have to be evidence from the Qur'an and Sunnah. For example, it can be, you know, the atheists, those atheists who believe that the only source of evidence is material scientific evidence. And we spoke about this uh, previously when we uh, spoke about scientism and how many atheists of today, they believe in scientism, which is the belief that realities can only be proven through the scientific method and through no other method. And this comes under the study of epistemology. What is considered evidence? What is not considered evidence? So these atheists, they believe that the only way to arrive at the reality of something, to prove something, is through science. So these atheists, they don't even believe in logical arguments or philosophical arguments. They, they, don't, they don't believe in any of that. And when you bring them logical evidence, for example, for the existence of Allah, they try to deconstruct it and they try to refute these evidences. And one of their common uh, methods of refuting it is by saying, you can bring whatever logical evidence you want in the end of the day. Science has not proven the existence of Allah, of God, so there's no way we can believe in it. And so these same atheists, these same atheists, you will find them you will find them sometimes when it comes to try to disprove the existence of Allah when it comes to try to prove that no no god exists they will sometimes re resort to logical arguments sometimes you find that they resort to logical arguments philosophical arguments so this is where we we should catch them and say you don't believe in logical arguments, logical reasoning. So why are you using this as a form of evidence? Another example is um, uh, Christian theologians in medieval times. They tried to discredit Islam by saying that although the Prophet ﷺ was indeed a true prophet from from God, he was only sent to the Arabs and not to all of mankind. And this was mentioned by Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah in his book Al-Jawab al-Sahih Liman Baddala Deen al-Masih The correct response to the one who changed the religion of al-Masih and this book of his was his uh, refutation of uh, Christianity. And here he had a debate with uh, a Christian theologian in which the Christian theologian, this is what he said. He said, you know what? Your Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, yes, based on the evidence that you have shown us, he is a, pro he is a true prophet from Allah. He is a true messenger. The Quran seems to be uh, authentic and it seems to be from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, no problem, we, we accept it. But uh, he was only sent to the Arabs. He was not sent to all of mankind. So here we respond by saying that if you agree in the Quran being from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then in the Qur'an, Allah clearly states that He sent Muhammad for all of mankind. So you cannot use the Qur'an, you cannot use the Qur'an in your favor. You cannot say, yes, the Qur'an is true, but it was only sent to the Arabs. Because you don't consider the Qur'an to be proof. 
you don't consider the Quran to be proof. And Ibn Taymiyyah, he uh, used this uh, way of refuting uh, this particular argument. So this was the third step. We now move on to the fourth step. The fourth step, so uh, the fourth step is basically looking at the proof once again, but looking at the relation between the proof and the conclusion that is being made. Looking at the relation and the link between the proof and the allegation that is being made against Islam, the conclusion of the proof, and then discrediting discrediting what is not considered a necessary conclusion. Discrediting what is not considered a necessary conclusion. And so after verifying that the allegation is backed by proof, and that the proof is authentic, and then making sure that we follow the steps to ascertain the validity of the proof, the next step is to look at the relation between the proof that is being used and the conclusion that is being made by the opponent. And so if the proof gives the necessary conclusion that is being made, if the proof is giving the necessary conclusion that is being made, that this is the necessary conclusion of this proof, that, you know, here is our proof, and by necessity, it proves this conclusion, this allegation. Then, in this case, we move on to the next step. We say, okay. Uh, we say, okay, we move on now. Otherwise, if there is no necessary conclusion between the proof and the allegation, then the argument falls apart. The argument falls apart. And with an example, uh, this step will be made uh, much, much more clearer, inshallah. So an example is those atheists who try to use the theory of ev evolution to prove that God does not exist. And so we respond by saying that this is not a necessary conclusion. This is not a necessary conclusion. It's not necessary that if, if the evolution theory is correct, it doesn't flow. The conclusion that you are making that God does not exist because the theory of evolution is true, this is not a necessary conclusion. This is not a necessary conclusion because how can we explain this? We say because the theory of evolution, first of all, it only deals with it only deals with life forms. It only deals with life forms, whether it be human beings or other life forms that they evolve over a period of time. Does the theory of evolution? deal with non-life forms? The answer is no. And so we have in this massive universe uh, things that are not living, planets, stars, and all these other things that are considered non-living. That are considered non-living. You cannot deny the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the basis of explaining how only living creatures came into existence. And so this does not show a necessary conclusion because we have all of these other non-living creatures. So the theory of evolution only deals with life life forms how can you use that to say that god did not create the planets or the sun or the stars 
And so we say, we say that this is a non-binding, non-binding conclusion or it is not a necessary conclusion of the proof. And this is obviously, if we say for argument's sake, that the theory of evolution is even valid. Another example, atheists who try to use the problem of evil, the problem of evil to deny the existence of Allah. Once again, once again, we respond by saying that the existence of evil and suffering, it does not disprove the existence of Allah. The only thing that maybe it, 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 it proves is that an all-merciful, all-powerful God does not exist. But it does not disprove the existence of a creator for the heavens and the earth. So they can't use this because it is not a necessary conclusion. It is not a necessary conclusion. The problem of evil is not a necessary conclusion to say that Allah does not exist. And uh, in fact, uh, we can turn it back on the atheist by saying that uh, you can't use the problem of evil unless you actually believe in God to begin with. You have to affirm that a God exists in order to say that, you know, the problem of evil uh, disproves the existence of God. Because as we said, it does not disprove the existence of God. It does not disprove the existence of Allah. So this is the fourth step. We now move on to the final step, the fifth step. And that is to make sure that the conclusion does not oppose another fact that is stronger. To make sure that the conclusion does not oppose another fact that is stronger, that its evidence is stronger. So some of our opponents, they may use what they consider to be authentic proof. So we don't consider it to be authentic, but let's say for argument's sake, okay, this is an authentic proof. We move on to the next step. They claim that the proof is understood correctly. Okay. Maybe it's not understood correctly. We say, okay. For argument's sake, let's move on. They say it even establishes a necessary conclusion of the proof. So there is, you know, a necessary conclusion. There is a relation between the proof and Conclusion, linking the two. Okay, for argument's sake, let's say yes. Then we find that the conclusion goes contrary to something else. Another fact that is stronger in evidence. And so in this case, we have to put forward the... the, the the fact that is stronger, the reality and the fact that is backed by a more solid and stronger evidence. And this is after we give in to their claims for argument's sake, not because we actually believe that their proofs hold any water. So we come to this, this last step we come to this last and final step to basically wipe them out because they are insisting, no, you know, for example, uh, you know, the theory of evolution, you tell them, no, it's, uh, it's only a theory. It's not a fact. They insist, no, it's a fact. And you know, they, you, you go on with them and they insist, no, you know, our argument holds water and, you know, uh, this is a strong, very, very strong proof that we have. So now you come to this final step to basically wipe them out. How? We say, okay, the examples, there are many examples of theories 
of theories that are claimed as scientific fact by atheists to try to prove that God does not exist. So they use these theories that they have, whether it be the theory of evolution, whether it be uh, how the universe uh, came into being, the Big Bang theory, whatever it be, they use these theories to try to say that God does not exist. They use scientific theories to say that God does not exist. So this is how we respond. This is how we respond. We say these theories are not established. They are not established scientific facts. They are simply theories based on certain hypotheses. This is number one. Number two, we say there is a missing link between the theories and using them as proof for God not existing. So there is no necessary conclusion, as we said. We show them how this proof is not a necessary conclusion that you are arriving at to say that God does not exist. The third point, these theories go against what proofs that we have that are more probable in proving the existence of Allah like logical arguments. So now we say, let us look at your theories and compare them to our evidences that we have for the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so we say that these logical arguments that we have and you know these logical arguments we we discussed them when we were talking about the evidences for Allah's existence so we say these logical arguments are they are perfectly certain logical conclusions and they go contrary to these theories that are not 100% certain they go contrary to these theories that are not 100% certain and science, it is always developing and evolving. Today, they come up with a theory and you think that it is a fact. And then tomorrow, they discover something else that goes contrary to that theory. And that's why there is no, uh, th that's why these theories that they come up with, they are simply theories. They are simply theories and not scientific facts. Yes, we're not saying that you know every theory is false or uh, is not a fact. There are certain theories that are facts that today we've discovered that, you know what, this is a scientific fact based on this theory. That's fine. But what we're talking about here are those theories that until today, they are still evolving and they have not arrived at you know, uh, the conclusion that these are facts that you have to accept. And so in this way, in this way, we have basically learned through these five steps how to deal with these common doubts, these shubuhat, these common allegations that are made against Islam by whether it be the enemies of Islam or by uh, certain groups of Muslims uh, like the modernist Muslims, so-called progressive Muslims. Uh, this is how we can deal with these, with these uh, allegations. And so now you have a map in front of you. Use this, use this to deconstruct their uh, shubuhat, their doubts and their allegations in the coming uh classes uh we will look uh at some of the more common uh shubuhat uh for example concerning the existence of allah for example the problem of evil uh also uh some of the common uh, shubuhat concerning whether it be the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or the Quran or some of the legislations of Islam such as uh, the hudud 
in Islam, the punishments, why are they so barbaric and so on and so forth, or, uh, you know, other legislations of Islam, we'll look at these shubuhat uh, in more detail, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. So with that, we come to the conclusion of this class. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.